Hello, my name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the president of the Danube Institute. And this is the latest of our lockdown dialogues, a series of conversations with people of interest, with experience in journalism, politics, science, literature, music, and the whole of the things we call the civilized arts, uh, discussing matters of common interest um, from here in uh, Budapest to, in this case, to John Fund, the distinguished American writer on politics, um, who has been, uh, who was for 28 years on the Wall Street Journal, is now a contributing editor to National Review, um, and is the author of um, seven books, uh, two of which we'll be discussing in the course of today's program. Now, John, I want to begin by asking you a question which is a very big question indeed, and it's important because practically no one in Europe is aware of exactly what has happened in recent months to make it one of the most explosive uh, scandals in American history. If I was asking you this question three years ago, I would have been asking you about the charge that President Trump, newly elected, um, was a Russian agent, which was in the story or the suspicion for about most of the last three years. Now, the whole narrative of that has been turned upside down and around. And the accusation now is that senior officials in the US government, the officials as important as the head of the um, CIA and the head of the FBI, were among a group of people who attempted to, um, to in effect, oust the president, even as he was just beginning his administration by false charges that he was an agent. Now, can I ask you just to tell me and the people listening in exactly how much truth there was in these two completely opposite charges and what is now happening? Well, John, it is a pleasure to be with you and your audience. As you know, I've long admired the work of the Danube Institute and what you do to keep Europe civilized. I would remind everyone that we have to go back to 2016. Uh, the election that everyone was surprised at. Uh, it is certainly clear that Russia was trying to interfere in our election as they have in previous elections. It was a low-grade disinformation campaign primarily focused on Facebook, uh, ads that were not seen by that many people, uh, trying to stir up dissension and uh, disagreement in the United States. Uh, that part is certainly true. What is also certainly true is that low-level people in the Trump campaign once in a while had very unfortunate contacts with people who would be calling them up since they were political amateurs and saying, you know, I'm with, uh, I have contacts with the Russian government. Uh, there may be information we have that you would be interested in. And there was one meeting between Donald Trump Jr., um, the then-candidate Trump's son, and a very sketchy Russian lawyer who claimed that she wanted to talk about adoption policy and was offering uh, information dirt on Hillary Clinton, which turned out to be nothing. It looked like it might be a sting operation because she met both before and after the meeting with a man named Glenn Simpson, who was the president of um, uh, an organization that was an opposition research firm retained by the Democratic National Committee. So that's the part on the Trump side. Uh, there were some unfortunate meetings uh, low-level contacts. There's no evidence that there was any coordination or uh, cooperation between the two. And Donald Trump fed into some suspicions by calling publicly for the Russians to release uh, emails that they might have collected that Hillary Clinton uh, might have concealed. So there's all of that. Now, let's move to the Washington side. Uh, there is certainly evidence now that based on these initial contacts between the Trump campaign and some low-level Russian operatives, an investigation was started. The investigation was trying to see if the Trump campaign was indeed riddled uh, with people who were cooperating with the Russians and sub in engaged in foreign uh, nefarious activity. Uh, as part of that, uh, because we have very tight privacy laws regarding uh, surveillance of American citizens, uh, the FBI prepared several submissions to a special court, the Foreign Intelligence Court, and said, we have this preliminary information 
that there's contacts between the Russians and the Trump campaign. And the thing they relied upon the most for those submissions to ask for the permission to launch their surveillance was something called the Steele dossier, which had been compare, compiled by a former British intelligence officer named Christopher Steele, who is now operating as a private citizen, a private consultant. And uh, that material convinced the court to agree to launch surveillance against Carter Page, who was a low-level Trump foreign policy advisor, and a couple of other people associated with the Trump campaign. So that carries us this, in the story up through just about the election of 2016. And then we enter a second phase of the story. Let me this, ask you right away, was that, was that were those applications uh, to the FISA court, the, the, the court overseeing intelligence agencies, was that information and uh, was that um, application um, to uh, intercept calls, was that in good faith at that point by the FBI officials? Well, we have not seen the specific application in full unredacted form. However, all of the evidence that we have is that it was so riddled with errors, so riddled with omissions, that someone was clearly trying to put one over, as we say, on the court and, engage, and get the applications approved under false pretenses. Now, what happened after Trump had won the election and is preparing uh, with, with people in the uh, transition team uh, to take over? Because that's when the next uh, stage in this story uh, began, isn't it? Yes. Uh, election night 2016. And by the way, my source here is a book called Shattered, which was written by two reporters who had been covering the Hillary Clinton campaign and had complete access to the internal workings of the Hillary campaign because they were planning to write a celebratory book on how she became the first female president. They report in their book Shattered that on election night, the Hillary campaign was so traumatized and so stunned at their election loss that they realized that uh, anyone associated with the campaign might be blamed for this. How in the world could you have lost to a Montebank like Donald Trump? So immediately on election night, uh, the word went out, well, uh, it wasn't our fault at all. It had to do with the Russians. The Russians subverted the election process. The Russians were behind all of this interest in Hillary Clinton's emails, the WikiLeaks uh, episode, all of this. So within hours of Donald Trump being declared the victor, uh, the race was on to try to blame the election defeat on Donald Trump so as to deflect blame from the actual architects of the defeat, which were a Hillary Clinton campaign that was slipshod, uh, amateurish, and didn't even visit the critical state of Wisconsin at all during the entire campaign. Now, the very first person to be, in a sense, the victim in the sec in, in in January of uh, 2017 was Michael Flynn, uh, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, um, very senior uh, intelligence officer um, who had resigned in um, under the Obama administration and who was about to become the national security advisor in the Trump administration. And all of a sudden, rumors begin to emerge that he may be guilty of. Um, incorrect, inappropriate conversations with the Russians. And uh, that brings him down. Can you tell us uh, that, about that and then what happened? Well, now that we have set the table for the media's intense interest and belief that the Russians had something to do with the Trump campaign victory, uh, we move to December and early January of 2017. And at that point, uh, it's clear that various elements of the U.S. intelligence community, especially in the FBI and including the CIA and other elements, uh, were very concerned that the Trump administration was bringing in officials who uh, wanted to shake things up, wanted to replace people at all of those agencies I mentioned. One of the people they were most concerned about was Michael Flynn, who was a former director of military intelligence under President Obama and knew the operations from the inside, who really could shake up things. Now, Flynn is not a completely innocent character here. He had some sketchy dealings with the Turks. He probably did not report some foreign contracts that he had that he should have. And he made, an, I think, a, a, an unfortunate appearance at a dinner uh, and sat next to President Putin 
uh, in Russia, of Russia in Moscow in 2015. Having said that, though, their real concern was that Flynn was a disruptor. And they had conducted an investigation of Flynn uh, because they monitored all of his conversations. And as incoming national security advisor, he was talking with the Russian ambassador and other things about UN sanctions. And the investigation came to nothing, though. Until early January, when the two FBI agents who were uh, most involved in this told superiors, wait a second, don't dismantle this investigation, give us one more chance. And what they proposed was that they call up Flynn at his office in the White House as soon as he took office and have an interview with him and see if they could trap him in a lie, see if they could quiz him and get him to say things that uh, were in conflict with the phone call that he had, for example, with the Russian ambassador. And sure enough, um, what you had is the deputy director of the FBI calling up his personal friend, General Flynn, this is Andrew McCabe, and saying, would you meet with these agents? They have some questions for you. Uh, they just want to walk through some things. They never told him it was a formal interview. They never told him they had to prepare. They never offered him the opportunity to bring his lawyer in. And he, they were personal friends. So two FBI agents show up at General Flynn's office uh, just after he had become national security advisor, sit down with him and immediately start grilling him about all of these questions. And at the conclusion, even though Flynn had not prepared for the interview and did not have a lawyer present, the two agents concluded that they, in their opinion, Flynn had not lied. But there were contradictions, or at least an apparent contradiction between what he had told the Russian ambassador uh, and the interview transcript. And that became the basis for charging Flynn with lying to government agents, which is a felony, and the rest of the story of his prosecution. Now, this particular aspect uh, of the scandal has blown apart in the last week, hasn't it? Can you just tell us about the way it's blown apart, and then we'll go back and look at one or two other aspects. Well, we now have handwritten notes from one of the top FBI officials who says, in his handwritten notes after a strategy meeting about how to interact with Flynn in this interview. What are our goals here? Are our goals to get him to confess? Are our goals to get him to lie? And then we can prosecute him and or get him fired. Now, by any stretch of the imagination, that's called entrapment. And that is not what you're supposed to do uh, in any law enforcement activity in a free country. And you certainly should not be doing it with the director of uh, the national security director of the president of the United States, because it so clearly can be viewed as a political move to embarrass an incoming administration. And of course, we now know this, and it's reached the point, I think, where Flynn is perhaps on the verge of being completely exonerated, that the court will um, uh, cancel uh, the, 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 uh, his guilty plea. We don't quite know exactly what will happen next, I think, but we, we, the general feeling in Washington that he has been exonerated and that the people who entrapped him are now facing serious possible prosecution. The judge that Flynn's case... Uh came before is a man named Emmett Sullivan, who has a long history of skepticism about prosecutors and the excesses to which they can be prone to, John. In fact, in 2009, he was the judge who found that the Justice Department at the time had engaged in egregious misconduct in prosecuting a senator named Ted Stevens, who was a Republican running for re-election in Alaska in 2008. He was convicted uh, by a jury of understating the value of renovations that had been made in his house by a personal friend. In other words, violating the financial disclosure forms that you're supposed to fill out as a senator. Uh, it turned out that the entire case was riddled with procedural uh, abuses and errors. The judge even ordered an internal investigation of the Justice Department to be conducted by independent entities, and ultimately people were fired. So this judge of all judges is aware the Justice Department can go off the rails. And I can tell you from my sources that he has two words for the Justice Department and the FBI right now, and they're not happy birthday. <laughs> well, thank you. Now, if we go back to uh, 2017, um, obviously, uh, um, uh, General Flynn is out of the administration. Um, he's possibly facing prison. 
um, he's out of the game politically for a while, but he's not the only victim at this point, is he? Because, or rather, immediately afterwards, we find two other victims. Um, one is uh, Carter Page, and the other is a young man called Papadopoulos, who was a fairly junior member of the, uh, of the Trump campaign. How did they get involved in this, and, and what has happened to them? Well, these were uh, low-level hangers-on in the Trump campaign. The Trump campaign did not have distinguished foreign policy advisors. It was a ramshackle affair at the time. And these people uh, were targeted, uh, I think, by circumstantial evidence that they had met with Russians in the past. And uh, apparently, there was a CIA agent of influence named uh, Steph Halper, uh, who had been a prof who's been a professor at the University of Cambridge for a long time. And uh, he apparently was tasked by the CIA to uh, investigate uh, these two characters and try to entrap them in incriminating uh, evidence and also to encourage, uh, encourage federal agents to meet with them and uh, perhaps uh, turn in higher ops in the Trump campaign. So this is an attempt to say that this is a campaign which is riddled with uh, unsavory characters and uh, what can we find out about them? And did it involve, for example, saying, um, has Donald Trump himself uh, committed some kind of offense or behaved in some inappropriate manner? Well, the Steele dossier is what was that. That was what was all about. The Steele dossier was filled with lurid, uh, outrageous, bizarre accusations about Donald Trump's finances, his personal behavior. Uh, there was a famous incident involving multiple prostitutes in a Moscow hotel room that was described. And it turns out that the FBI, even though they had paid, or I'm sorry, they had, they had promised to pay all the expenses of uh, Mr. Steele uh, and was, was not only aware of the fact that this dossier had been prepared, uh, by lawyers associated with the Democratic National Committee. They had p paid Steele to prepare this dossier. They not only knew that and withheld that information from the Foreign Intelligence Advisory Court, but uh, they knew that Steele's information within that report was based on secondhand, thirdhand sources and could not be proven and was unreliable. In fact, they ultimately dumped Steele because they could no longer fully trust him. So let's now step forward to the present. We've seen, well, you've just told us what has happened in the Flynn case. But more generally, is there a sense that the whole um, allegation, uh, uh, set of allegations against Donald Trump have collapsed? Um, and if so, what's going to happen through the summer? Um, because that would seem to be a fairly major item in political debate in an election year. Yes, but of course the virus and all of the political, health, and economic impacts that flow from that uh, tend to overshadow it. But as we recover from the virus, I think that more and more of this picture will come into focus because there's several investigations that have been initiated by the new Attorney General, Bill Barr, uh, that are looking into all of these connections. Uh, one is by the U.S. Attorney in Utah. He's the one looking through the Flynn case to see if there were not uh, prosecutorial errors and uh, abuses. Another is by the U.S. Attorney in Connecticut, Mr. Durham, and he is looking into the whole affair regarding the FBI's role in this matter and the FISA application. And there are internal investigations with the Justice Department. All of these are probably going to be concluded by the end of the summer, so we will have a much clearer and sharper picture of exactly who abused the process, how it was done, and frankly, how the cover-up was accomplished. Because as we know in Washington, John, ever since Watergate, there's been a stock phrase, which has, in Henry Kissinger's words, the added advantage of being true. The cover-up is always worse than the crime. Well, I'll move on in, a, in one moment, but the final question here I want to ask is this. We know what the president thinks of this because he's been very vocal throughout um, the last three years. Uh, we also know what the new attorney general uh, thinks about it. He's said it's one of the most outrageous um, assaults on the U.S. presidency that he can recall. Um, what are the Democrats saying about it? Because all of a sudden the tables have been turned on them. Well, they're saying this is a distraction and they're using the president's uh, unfortunate uh, rhetorical excesses against him to say whatever the president says you can't believe. 
But there are genuine miscarriages of justice here. Remember, Robert Mueller's investigation took over two years. It was Robert Mueller who prosecuted, for example, George Papanopoulos, one of the two people that you mentioned who had been targeted for surveillance by the FBI. Papadopoulos was convicted. He had to spend 12 days in jail. He has a criminal record now. And it turns out that during the time the Mueller prosecutors were pursuing him, they knew the Steele dossier and much of this was either unreliable or fabricated. So they have a real explanation as to how in the world they managed to pursue someone that under any normal set of circumstances they should have known was innocent. Now, I think we must move on to the general political situation and ask you this. Um, uh, when you look at the entire scene, the, the uh, coronavirus, um, the backwash from this scandal, um, I would say the general anxiety now about the American economy, um, how do you assess the prospects for, of, the, uh, uh, of both campaigns? But let's begin with President Trump's campaign. I would have thought ooh, a few months ago he was probably a shoe in but with the economy likely to be in ruins, well, one has to put a big question mark against that. How do you think his prospects look today? Uh, his prospects have declined since the onset of the virus. Um, he, I think, can overexpose himself. He is constant briefings, which often resulted in disputatious and pointless uh, altercations with the press, uh, tarnished his image. Uh, there has been some confusion in the administration about the response to the virus, and the economy is in dire shape. We have over 33 million unemployed now. So those set of circumstances has mitigated the usual uh, rally around the flag uh, response that you see in a national crisis where the popularity of leader tends to go up. Trump's popularity is stable, and his but his ratings against Joe Biden, the almost certain Democratic candidate, uh, are a little bit down. If the election were held today, I think Trump would be an underdog. But the election is not held today. It's being held in exactly six months from now. So I think President Trump, who was planning to win based on a very, very strong economy, uh, now has to do a very, very narrow, uh, calibrated campaign focused on his response to the crisis the economic recovery, which will probably be underway by the time of the election, and his ability to paint uh, Joe Biden as unreliable and shaky and out of touch. Now, let's turn to the Democrats. Um, Biden, as you say, is the almost certain candidate. You might want to explain that remark. Um, but um, what kind of campaign, if he gets the job, will he run? And in particular, who do you think his vice president is going to be? John, in the modern age, what we've seen is if you're a controversial public figure and you stay out of the public eye, your ratings tend to go up. <laughs> Trapped in his basement uh, for two months, uh, he's been relegated to doing podcasts and occasional uh, webinars like the ones we're having today, and uh, his ratings are stable or up. Uh, as soon as he escapes from his basement um, and has to give major speeches or answer tough questions, uh, there's real doubt, even within Democratic circles, that he's up for it. He's 77 years old, but he looks older. Uh, the president is only three or four years younger, but looks more vigorous. And Biden has a, always had a gaffe-prone uh, history, and that's only been exacerbated uh, by his recent appearances from his basement. Uh, he also faces uh, the sudden emergence of a charge of uh, sexual assault from a woman who worked on his staff 27 years ago. Um, her story has been had been largely ignored by the mainstream media until last week when the blatant hypocrisy in comparing the media's reaction to dealing with that story with how they treated far less uh, credible accusations against Brett Kavanaugh, who was a nominee for the Supreme Court two years ago, uh, finally forced Biden in his basement to issue a denial and uh, make a somewhat persuasive case uh, for himself but one that still leaves unanswered questions and leaves, for example, media organs like the New York Times running op-ed pieces now saying Biden uh, 
Biden should consider stepping down or Biden should consider an even more forceful response. Um, and what about the, the vice presidential choice he's going to make? He has promised, and this is before the virus hit, that it will be a woman. And uh, this boxes him in somewhat uh, because the available choices uh, will have to address the Tara Reid scandal, the scandal of sexual, an alleged sexual assault against that Biden uh, committed in 1993. So far, all of the Democratic female senators who called for the head of uh, Brett Kavanaugh when he was nominated for the Supreme Court are rallying behind Joe Biden. But that doesn't mean it, will, it won't be an awkward fit for them because there may be other charges coming forward. One, thing's, one thing we know from these kind of uh, events in the Me Too um, movement's history is if someone accuses you of something, true or not, other people may well step forward and uh, try to um, ride the uh, media wave of publicity. So this makes Biden's choice an awkward one. I don't think he's going to pick someone like Stacey Abrams, the Democratic candidate for governor in Georgia last time, who is openly campaigning for the slot. Uh, she has been far too pushy and has far too thin a resume. Democratic moderates hope that he'll um, appoint uh, Amy Klobuchar, who was one of his presidential campaign rivals and who is a solid, stable set of hands. Uh, other choices are Kamala Harris, who also ran for president and is a senator from California, and there are other names in the mix. Now, we've talked about his, uh, uh, Biden's choice. Uh, what about Trump's choice? I mean, is he going to go with, with Pence again, or might he go with someone like, uh, again, a very attractive candidate, one would, again, one would assume, Nikki Haley, um, formerly governor of South Carolina, and of course, in since between now and then, um, she was his representative as UN, a U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. I think Ambassador Haley has a very promising political future, but three facts mitigate against any change on Trump's ticket. One, uh, it's a truism, but it happens to be true, that very few people vote ultimately on the basis of who is someone's vice presidential candidate. Uh, that's been true across parties for many years. Two, President Pence has been a stable, loyal uh, assistant to President Trump. And three, as the head of the Corona Task Force fighting the virus, he has gone up in Trump's estimation because uh, Pence has proven to be a seasoned manager and someone who has uh, sanded over some of Trump's rough spots in those briefings. Uh, with a certain calm and a certain direction of purpose. Would you say that now Pence himself would be someone whom the American public not just simply tolerate, but regard as a man who actually could be president in the event that the uh, President Trump were for some reason to leave office? Well, they've seen a lot more of Pence in recent weeks than they have in the past. As you know, the vice presidency is often an invisible job. <laughs> but with the virus, he's everywhere. And he represents the president in all of the key meetings and the key briefings. So, yes, I think his profile has gone up dramatically in much the same way that um, Richard Nixon raised his profile in the late 1950s when he had the kitchen table debate uh, with Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, and of course also uh, braved uh, a rioting cr crowd in uh, Caracas, Venezuela that was uh, chanting anti-American slogans and throwing things at him. So these events that uh, put the vice president in the news uh, offer a real opportunity for someone to shine in a job that usually doesn't. At this moment to the two books you've written, because they're very relevant to the election campaign. First, uh, the first one is the book on voter fraud, and um, the second on postal voting, which I think you fear will lead to more voter fraud. Um, and my question is, um, will voter fraud be a factor of any serious kind in the election? Um, can protests about it uh, become a serious election issue? Uh, or will they be overwhelmed by the fact that the response uh, from the Democrats to accusations of voter fraud is to deny them and suggest that they are a cover for attempting to deny minorities the opportunity to vote. Um, can, give us an idea of where you think voter fraud um, and postal voter fraud fit into this election campaign. Well, this subject is a very sad one in one respect. For many years, it was a bipartisan effort 
to make sure that American elections had integrity and could be trusted. And I give you as an example the 2002 Help America Vote Act, which was passed after our disputed Bush-Gore election. This was a bipartisan effort. The Democratic co-sponsor, Senator Chris Dodd of Connecticut, said, our goal is two things, to make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. And we're Americans, we can accomplish both. So unfortunately, uh, in the last 15 years, this has become a very partisan and bitter issue. Democrats who used to cooperate with voter integrity initiatives now say there is no voter fraud. Well, I refer anyone to the Heritage Foundation's website, which you can easily look up, which has a database of over 1,500 people who in recent years have not just been caught committing voter fraud, but have been convicted in a court of the issue. So given that it's very partisan, here's where we now are. Uh, Democrats are, are insisting that part of the response to the virus in the United States has to be an abandonment of our normal practice by which people show up at a polling place, present themselves, give their name. In many states, they have to give an ID uh, with a photograph, and that secures confidence and integrity in elections. They are wanting to throw that all out because of fears that people will be infected and replace it with all postal voting. Uh, this would mean that everybody would be voting through the mail, and there are multiple problems with this. For example, the Democrats in all of their lawsuits and initiatives now are saying we can dispense with the normal precautions against fraud using postal voting. Uh, the normal precautions are that in most states you have to have a witness who says, I saw this person fill out the ballot, I know this person. Uh, they also have to have um, a proper signature that is authorized and checked by an election official compared to the signature that's on file. And they also can must deliver their ballot themselves or have a family member do it if they're ill. And they cannot have a political operative go door to door collecting such ballots, perhaps assisting people in how to, they should be filled out and then delivering them en masse to the election authorities. Remember, postal voting uh, makes fraud much more easy because it's outside the chain of custody of a government official. In a polling place, there are government officials watching. And in places other than Chicago and some notorious hotspots, uh, you have some protection there. Uh, if you have all postal voting and you have eliminated the precautions, I'm not saying there will be massive voter fraud, but in close elections, in close states, the temptation and the the low risk that uh, this creates can, um, shall we say, bring out the unscrupulous in human nature. Tell me, when you put questions about voter fraud to the people in opinion polls, what kind of answers do you get? How, how um, angry, upset or bored are American voters by the topic? Americans, by about four to one, support the concept of having people show a photo ID at the polls. Uh, they have to show a photo ID for many different things and uh, it doesn't strike them as unusual or bizarre for them to take that precaution at a polling place. Uh, interestingly enough, when asked if this is a serious concern, uh, more African Americans and more Hispanics in a Washington Post poll three years ago uh, said they were concerned voter fraud was a real issue than Caucasians. And the reason for that is much of the voter fraud takes place in political machine uh, jurisdictions. These are jurisdictions where uh, machines uh, run a tight control of the political process. They deliver bad public services. They have high taxes. Uh, the schools are bad. Uh, and any time a reformer tries to upset this system, uh, they often are intimidated uh, the votes are stolen, and I can give you examples from St. Louis to Milwaukee to Kansas City, where the primary victims of voter fraud turn out to be minority voters, because they're the ones who often live in circumstances where the political machines commit the most fraud. Uh, but overall, the American people are concerned about, yes, the right to vote, but they're also concerned about having their vote canceled out by someone who shouldn't be voting, whether they're because they're dead, have moved out of state, are no longer eligible because of a prison conviction, or for some other reason. And uh, 
they're suspicious, but again, the media, of course, uh, downplays all of these concerns and underreports all of these cases. I'd like to know, John, since you are actually an expert in America's two political parties, I'd like to do a deep dive into both of them. Um, let's look first of all at the Democrats. Uh, they have moved, it seems to outsiders at least, particularly from abroad, they've moved quite sharply to the left in recent years. They've become, in some respects, a different kind of party. Would you like to just analyze the Democrats for us? Well, identity politics is the single most important ideological component of the modern Democratic Party. The Democratic Party, whether it was run by Franklin Roosevelt or uh, Harry Truman or Hubert Humphrey or even Jimmy Carter, was a party that was primarily concerned with the interests of the working man, even though it was an often a chaotic coalition of everyone from southern segregationists to wealthy plutocrats to labor union leaders. Uh, the party pitched itself as the party of the common man for the average middle class American and the person aspiring to join the middle class. Sometime in the last 20 years, the party's various uh, ethnic components started asserting themselves. So the party became fragmented very much along the lines of, are you part, yes, you may be a Democrat, but are you primarily motivated by being part of the gay lobby, by being part of the African-American liberation movement, by being part of La Raza Unida, um, Hispanic consciousness, any number of groups who assert that their interests should take priority rather than the interests of the electorate as a whole. And as a result, the Democratic Party has become a coalition of forces, uh, all intent on securing power, but often with very different motives and very different emphasis as to where that power should be exercised. Now, um, I want to suggest that the, the Republican Party has also undergone a major change since, um, particularly since Donald Trump. And um, there's no doubt that you hear you have groups of people called never Trumpers who are Republicans and make it plain that they think their party's gone astray. Um, uh, is that the case? And is the Republican Party a different kind of party too? And if so, how? Well, there used to be cliches that if you were rich, you voted Republican. And if you were highly educated, you voted, tended to vote Republican until you got to the PhD level where you were overeducated. Uh, those are no longer the case. Increasingly, uh, wealthy suburbs like Greenwich, Connecticut, or Buckhead near Atlanta um, are voting more Democratic. And uh, the educational uh, attainment of the average Republican voter has gone down to uh, co college level, high school level. Uh, the working class is much more likely to be Republican now. Um, I think what you're seeing is a realignment of the parties based on economic interests. Uh, the Democratic Party is a coalition of elites, especially elites who derive their uh, status and their income from government in the higher echelons, and uh, a large number of people in the lower strata of income in society. Republicans um, often uh, find uh, Trump uh, repellent, uh, often find him uncouth, uh, he's not their style, and as a result, uh, they have gravitated towards either neutrality, towards Trump, or sometimes, as you say, with the never Trumpers, outright hostility. So all of these have changed the electoral landscape. So you have states like Wisconsin and Iowa, which traditionally would vote Democratic, that Donald Trump carried and is still com running very competitively in. And then you have states like Arizona or Colorado, which uh, used to be an ancestrally Republican, but now either vote Democratic or in danger of slipping into Democratic ranks. So do we see one of two things here? Um, do we see a serious realignment of the parties so that they've become uh, completely different organizations? And secondly, um, you know, when you and I were um, 20 years ago looking at these questions, 
Um, we used to talk, we listened to other people talking too, about the idea of the emerging democratic majority, a kind of inevitable process almost, in which the Democrats would become the majority party as a result of some of the trends you were just describing. How does that theory look today? Uh, still current, but uh, premature still, I believe. Uh, there apparently is very little uh, to shake the adherence of most black Democrats to their party. However, we're seeing, especially with younger black males under the age of 40, uh, more interest in the Donald Trump approach of aspirational economics, of rising up and bettering themselves. So I think Trump may do slightly better in that category than he did last time. At the same time, um, it, it's a curious fact, but Donald Trump actually did better among Hispanics than Mitt Romney did. He secured a third of the vote as opposed to Romney's 29 percent. And what we're seeing with Joe Biden is uh, there's a great lack of enthusiasm for Biden. Biden. He clearly leads Trump, but there's uh, he only gets about 50 percent of Hispanics who actively support him. Trump gets about 30 percent. The rest are apathetic or not decided. Uh, the Asian community is very complicated because it's made, made up of 20 or 25 different nationalities. I think the Democrats very much um, want to, yes, have immigration and especially uh, the flood of immigration that we've had redound to their advantage. But they're realizing that if they if the people naturally assimilate in American society, they don't get as many of those votes as they would think or want. So. That's why the identity politics is important, to try to constantly create division and constantly create a sense of grievance and a belief that white Americans are hostile to them. And by doing that, by keeping people within their community, uh, for example, in the Spanish in the Spanish speaking communities, as much as possible, keeping them speaking Spanish and watching Spanish media, uh, there is more effort that they can, there is less effort they'll have to do to achieve a majority. So I think that yes, the country is changing demographically. Yes, that does benefit the Democrats, but it's by no means a sure thing. And Donald Trump, for all of his faults, and there are many, is scrambling that equation a bit because he's the kind of rough and tumble figure many people in minority communities can admire. Well, as a matter of fact, I was going to raise the question of whether or not uh, um, Trump was appealing to uh, Hispanic males because he did seem a, kind of a more manly figure, which culturally speaking seems to have appeal, and more appealing perhaps to Asian Americans uh, because Asian Americans obviously are disadvantaged by affirmative action. And that's something which n no, neither parties come out against, but everybody knows the Republicans are much more unhappy with it than the Democrats are. You're right. I would say with the uh, grievances of Asian Americans regarding affirmative action, and there's a famous case at Harvard, which you're familiar with, that's certainly true, but it probably affects only a relative sliver of the Asian American community that are trying to get their children into the top elite schools. Having said that, though, Asians are very entrepreneurial. And what you're seeing is that Donald Trump's visit to India, for example, where he was greeted by hundreds of thousands of Indians and embraced by the Indian Prime Minister, played very well in the Indian community in America. And I would point out to you, John, that the wealthiest and most educated subsection of America now are Indian Americans from the subcontinent. Uh, they're incredibly successful in America. So I believe the, that you're absolutely right that Trump's machismo can play a role here. But when you look at the Hispanic vote, John, Here's the single biggest factor that I have found. About, I'm being somewhat simplistic here, but about half of Hispanics in America speak Spanish at home, and about half speak English at home as their primary language. Well, if you look at Hispanics who speak English at home, Donald Trump basically tied last time, or even might have won it by a point or two. Among the half of Hispanics who speak Spanish at home, who are somewhat, you could say, culturally isolated from some mainstream elements of American society, they went for Hillary Clinton by 35 or 40 points. So, yes, all of the factors you mentioned are clear. But it, what is clear is 
it, the more that Hispanics enter the mainstream of American society, the more their political attitudes change. And isn't it also clear that the more, uh, the higher the levels of immigration into the Hispanic community, the more the progress towards total assimilation and therefore a more even political split is diminished by the arrival or is retarded by the arrival of people who swell the ranks of non-English speaking Hispanic communities. Yes, absolutely. The rate of increase is important. And that is why for much of our country, there has been a desire to have a pipeline of immigration, but to not have it swamp the boat, so to speak. And I think that more and more people are coming to that realization. In fact, that's one of the reasons for uh, uh, the, the split in the parties. Uh, it used to be that Democrats, especially Democrats affiliated with labor unions, were very concerned by unfair competition from uh, immigrant labor, whether it was legal or illegal. That has been swept away by the identity politics revolution that I mentioned earlier. Um, the other, the biggest single group, not a minority actually, but the majority, is women. Now I think if we were to talk to Donald Trump, he would say how much he likes women. And indeed, by the way, in his company, he, he seems to have treated them very well and given them opportunities and so on. But that affection does not seem to be reciprocated by the American woman voter. Or is that changing? Well, Donald Trump carried white women against Hillary Clinton. Uh, it was only the overwhelming support of minority women that uh, changed the gender balance there. Uh, but it's fair to say that Donald Trump's style, his personality, his uh, overbearing attitudes in some cases, uh, don't play well with many suburban women. Uh, they just find him uncouth. Uh, I know a good friend who says he constantly reminds me of my first husband. <laughs> so there's a stylistic problem there. Well. Uh, there is another problem, isn't there, which is the question of marriage, because in, as well as marry, as well as um, white women being more favourable uh, to him than, uh, than minority women, so I think also married women tend to be more favourable to him than single women. And that, that does not just apply to him, of course, has been true for the Democrat-Republican split now for some years. Oh, absolutely. Uh, if you want to go to any metropolitan area and find a single female, the odds that they will be voting for Donald Trump are not nil, but very <laughs> low. And uh, similarly, if you go to a rural area and find a middle-aged white male, uh, the odds of him voting for a Democrat are now vanishingly small. So we're seeing the country polarized in so many ways that we didn't used to. In fact, it, 25 years ago, uh, a majority of American counties uh, would often vote one candidate of one party for president, but vote for a member of Congress from the other party. That has almost completely vanished. You either live in red territory now or in blue territory. Now let's now turn to the other great problem that's facing America and think about its political impact too. Obviously, I'm talking about uh, the coronavirus 19 uh, pandemic. Now, as well as the medical and technical and scientific arguments, increasingly, it seems, uh, COVID-19 is becoming politicized, becoming also ideologized. Uh, politicians, journalists, scientists are adopting their favorite solution, and there's a real battle beginning to emerge uh, in, the, um, in the media about it. I want to ask, um, which party is likely to benefit, which to lose in this battle? Um, how has the, uh, how has the um, pandemic become, so to speak, politicized? In which directions and why? John, that is an incredibly important question. And um, we're still in the fog of virus, so to speak, yeah. about that. Uh, I am an editor of a newsletter published by the Committee to Unleash Prosperity, which just issued ratings for all of our 50 state governors. As you know, our response to the virus here in this country is very much on the state level rather than a one comprehensive national res response. And uh, what we find is that with some exceptions, it's red state governors that uh, are very worried about the soaring unemployment, the shuttered businesses, uh, the collapse of the economy, and are trying to reopen for business uh, with obvious precautions and social distancing. It's blue state governors that are trying to keep an iron grip on things 
And even though the lockdown in the United States was first sold as being one to flatten the curve to make sure that the healthcare systems weren't overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients, now we've suddenly moved the goalposts. It's now to stamp down the virus. And as you know, I think this is a debate that is starting to happen in Europe as well. Uh, can you really stamp down the virus or can you just, with the abs in the absence of a vaccine, can you just shift the number of cases into the future? Uh, and that's one of the debates that we're having that I've written about regarding Sweden's approach, which I think is very interesting and is raising all kinds of uh, ideological questions here. Because in the United States, Bernie Sanders and many other leftists were always referring to Sweden as their nirvana, their heaven. Uh, they were comprehensive welfare state policies, progressive politics. Now Sweden has become the uh, brunt of vicious criticism for being heartless, cruel, and uh, pragmatic about its approach to the virus. So the tables have turned completely, and it's not so much about scientific evidence on the virus as it is ideological perceptions of it. Um, that one of these applies to the important question, of course, of, of the numbers. And one of the things which strikes me, and you dealt with it, I think, partly in your article, is uh, um, uh, does, how does America, how do um, Sweden, uh, how does Sweden, how do the European countries uh, count uh, the deceased? It looks to me as though, for example, in Britain, we exaggerate the numbers of people dying from the virus because when you look at the numbers dying from influenza, they have gone down. And one wonders if practically everybody who dies in a hospital who may show signs of having had the virus is uh, recorded as dying from the virus rather than dying from associated um, underlying illnesses they may have. Well, you raise an excellent and politically incorrect question, John. Uh, in the United States, if you are tagged as having died from COVID-19, uh, the hospital uh, gets a 20% bonus from Medicare, which is our health care system for elderly people. Uh, and if they tag something else, they don't get the bonus. And as you know, hospitals, because they've abandoned elective surgeries in many cases, are going bankrupt. So the temptation, the financial temptation is there. On the other side of the equation, there are clearly some people who die at home and uh, they, uh, they're never tagged as having died from COVID. I do think there's some overcounting. Uh, I've tried to look at this question. It's hard to nail down, but I certainly think that as students of public choice economics, we cannot ignore the financial incentives here to state and local governments that are going broke and looking for cash under every uh, couch cushion. And of course, um, the same thing applies to the political uh, incentive uh, to exaggerate or minimize deaths, depending on which party it will benefit. A very quick answer on this, John, if I could, but um, who do you think is winning the battle of the coronavirus between Trump and the Democrats? If you look at the polls, the Democrats are winning. Uh, Trump is narrowly negative regarding his response to the virus. and. Um, but if you look at people's actual behavior, they want out of the lockdown, they want their life back, and they're willing to take slightly more risks than they had in the past, and that's to Trump's advantage in the medium term. And it, there are signs, I think, of, the way of, of Americans, large numbers of them anyway, being far more concerned about the threat to their civil liberties than is the case in Europe, where there doesn't seem to be nearly so much anxiety on that score. Well, as you know, John, we're an individualistic country founded out of a revolution against uh, the mother country that you may be familiar with. <laughs> and uh, that, that uh, quasi-libertarian spirit still beats much within us. I now have a final question, John, and that's China. Um, there are two aspects of China, it seems to me, in American politics of great importance. One is, has there been a general change, perhaps not fully bipartisan, but composed of supporters of both parties in their attitude to China? And secondly, looking at China and America's relations, um, do the voters look at them and think, well, it seems to me that Trump began to get th this one right quicker than other people, not the virus, but the, the uh, whether or not China was a reliable and friendly power rather than a serious adversary? 
My sources in the intelligence community say that if evidence comes forward, and they think it will, that the virus originated by accident in a Chinese laboratory, but they covered it up and that cost the world dearly, that will definitely change the opinion of China. John, two quick points on this. Uh, first, uh, the United States has woken up to the fact that in some areas, 90% of our pharmaceuticals come from China. That's a supply chain problem and a dependence problem that has to be fixed immediately. Uh, I think there are plans now to immediately uh, reduce regulatory barriers to building new pharmaceutical plants in the United States so we can secure that supply chain. Secondly, uh, it is certainly true uh, that the Chinese prosperity began with their 2001 admission into the World Trade Organization. Uh, they promised to play by a certain set of rules. They promised to abide by a certain set of decisions. They clearly have just used it as a springboard for opportunity uh, to um, secure competitive advantage. Uh, I think that the world has to look at Chinese membership in the World Trade Organization very carefully and seriously. Are they members in good standing or are they outlaws that need to be disciplined and perhaps thrown out of the WTO? So, John, the start of a new Cold War or the start of a new lukewarm war? Yes, indeed. And uh, but I don't think I don't I think it can be conducted while normal economic relations to a large extent continue, but with a much clearer eyed, much more pragmatic and much more realistic approach about the risks involved. John, we're very much in your debt. You've given us a wonderful tour of American politics and all of the great issues currently associated with it and a terrific insight into what is likely, set of insights, into what is likely to be the um, result and indeed the, the whole f festival and carnival of the next election campaign. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John, and thank you for your excellent questions and best of luck to you with the Danube Institute. Thank you so much.